Everyone can hear me okay? Perfect. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. First of all, uh, my name is James. Again, I'm here to talk about uh, helical piles. I represent a company called Goliatech. Uh, we manufacture and install helical piles. We work on a franchise, franchisee-based system, which I'll talk a lot more about as the slides progress. So Lisa is one of our installers. She actually has a, a number of crews here. So I'll let her just introduce herself. Okay, my uh, can you hear me? Okay, my name is Lisa Bue. I started out um, uh, as a actually a commercial drywall taper in the '80s, right out of high school, and then went to school as a uh, to be become a building inspector. So I was a building inspector and uh, residential plans examiner uh, for Maple Grove for about 13 years, and then <clears throat> when this opportunity came came about to uh, join Goliatech, I jumped. Um, with both feet, because this will revolutionize concrete footings. And I looked at this and I went, oh my God, you need a building official on your sales staff. So that's kind of what I do for um, uh, Goliath Tech here in Minnesota. We also have that we have the whole Midwest. So um, <clears throat> my business cards are up front. If you guys have any questions, um, we take care of this whole area. Please call me. Um, I deal with a lot of uh, structural engineers, a lot of soils people. Braun uh, it tends to be, you know, somebody I work with quite a bit. Um, and having been in the code industry, <clears throat> I, I'm very familiar with soils and, and uh, reports and that kind of thing. So um, I just wanted to, if, we, if you have questions, I also brought Nick, one of our installers with us. Um, and so if you have questions, please reach out or give me a call um, and we can discuss what you got going on. Thanks. Perfect. All right, so like I said, uh, Goliath Tech, at Goliath Tech, not only do we manufacture, but we install helical piles as well. So Lisa is one of our many installers. So we have a network of installers throughout Canada, uh, England and France as a matter of fact as well, but for now let's stick with uh, North America. So we're a Canadian based company. We manufacture everything. Uh, in-house in our plant. It's about an hour southeast of Montreal in Quebec, Canada. We manufacture everything in-house with a combination of American and Canadian steel. Okay, so forgive me if some of this is a little bit basic. I just want to talk briefly uh, about the basic helical pile to bring everyone up to speed. So out of sheer interest, how many people are aware of helical piles, have seen them used, have used them in, in some kind of project or, or called for them? Perfect, perfect. <laughs> Out of sheer interest, what were the projects? Large, small, they were, were reparations, they were the new builds, all of the above. Okay, so why were helical piles spec in any of the projects, of all of the above? There's a very established marketplace here in Minneapolis amongst a number of contractors who have been installing helical piles since 1991. This market very established the market and there's very strong players. Okay, but so okay, fair enough. But I was, I, I, my question was more directed, like, why was it because of the soil was 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 terrible, uh, liquefiable soils, frost depth, yeah. Vibration. Okay. Trying to get away from the vibrations, space constraints. Okay, fair enough. That's 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 one I hear I hear a lot. Yep. Very low capacity foundations. And then yep. Something Excellent. Perfect. Very okay. Yeah. Sorry. Deep Perfect. So, so those are all right. So those are all the, the, what I hear all the time, the advantages of helical piles. Of course, there are others as well that we'll talk a little bit more about. Okay, so what is a helical pile? A helical pile is literally a large screw we install in the ground with our calibrated installation equipment. With that calibrated installation equipment, we are reading the resistance real time as we install that helical pile. From the resistance or the torque we're reading real time, we can calculate how much compression and tension loads we can put on that pile. There is no guesswork. Obviously, when I'm talking about compression loads, I'm talking about how much weight we can put on top of the pile, tension, how much it takes to pull that pile out of the ground. Okay, very easy visual. If I say a given pile has 5,000 pounds of tension capacity, it takes the same amount of force to, to pull that pile out of the ground as it does to lift a 5,000 pound block of concrete. Now that's not exactly true because as we'll learn in a few slides, all the numbers I will be talking about all have a safety factor of two. So its ultimate would be 10. 
Okay, so a helical pile has three main parts. Probably the most important part is the helix or the load-bearing plate. So for our calculations at Goliath Tech, when our in-house engineering department does calculations, we always calculate the, the load is supported or taken by, 100% of the load rather, is taken by the helix itself. Yes, I agree that we, we do have some skin friction there, but we ignore it for our calculations. 100% of the capacity of our helical piles are calculated on the helix itself. So um, out of sheer interest, do you know a soil conditions why we would increase a helix size and or the number of helices on a given lead section? Right. Yeah. Generally, exactly. Soft soil, soft, wet soil, exactly. A harder, rockier soil, we would use a smaller helix, softer, marshier soil, if you, if you want to visualize it that way. It'll be a larger helix and or multiple helices. Now, not to go into too much detail, but there is every tube size, and that's how we talk about pile size. When I say a larger pile, I'm always talking about the outside diameter of the tube, not the helix itself. That always causes a bit of confusion. People say, oh, I have a big pile, but it's actually a small tube, but a big helix. In the industry, in the industry wide, when we say large pile, it's a large tube. Okay, so there is a math on how big a given helix can be on the size of a tube. So that's why we have multiple helices on a lead section. For instance, you cannot put a 30 inch helix on a two and seven inch tube. It doesn't work that way. It would turn into a bowl, there's too much leverage. So that's why we'd have multiple helices on the lead section, whereas the square inch of contact on the soil would actually be the same. So the capacity would actually be the same. Okay, okay. Second part of the helical pile is the pile shaft or the tube. Again, always talking about the outside diameter. We have pile sizes from inches and seven eighths all the way up to 12 and three quarter and, and literally every size in between so that we have a pile size for a given job because we can always spec a larger pile for a given job. But again, we don't, we, we, we become not price competitive if we spec a, an enormous pile for a relatively small job. Hence, we have a, a, a literally a size for every job. The other and also very important part of the helical pile is the pile head or the attachment point. So as the manufacturer, I hear this often from engineering firms who would like to use helical piles in their design, but they do not want to be responsible for that connection point. So for so example, a very easy example to visualize is a steel structured building. They'd like to use helical piles, but they do not want to be responsible for that connection point, the pile head, the top of the pile. So because we are the manufacturing, uh, we, we are the manufacturer and we have the in our uh, engineering department, we can design, spec, and have our engineers actually sign off on that pile head. So we take 100% 100% responsibility for that connection point. So it takes the, the, the liability, the stress, if you will, off the engineer. So that's a huge draw for a lot of engineering departments, uh, engineering firms I, I speak with. Okay. Now here's a super brief history of the helical pile. Um, obviously we did not invent the helical pile. It has been around since about the 1850s. I know it says 1836 here. Oh, actually we changed it. So it says 1850s. Um, and the reason it came to be is because they needed a, some a solution for lighthouses on the waterfront that were sinking in the mud. That's why helical piles came to be. Now, maybe some, um, some people say, well, the, 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 the water screw has existed since ancient times. Fair enough, but let's not complicate my conversation here. So as you can see, they used to install them by hand. Now, so when I hear our installers uh, give me a call and they say, wow, it's really hot sitting on that excavator installing that helical pile all day, I really have very, very, very little sympathy for you. So let's think of these poor devils screwing that thing in the ground. So there's still a few, there's still a few of these original lighthouses still standing on their original helical pile foundation. So again, we did not invent the helical pile. It's a proven deep foundation solution. Uh, and like many, many industries, many companies, we have built our company on 
tests that have been done by others. Now, that being said, every single thing we design from helical piles, heads, bolts, and everything in between, we test them ourselves. So I have a few slides uh, show you that we actually destructive test everything we design as well. So we're not just blindly following tests done by others. Now, some of you may be interested there is a book, it's called A Practical Guide to Design and Installation of, of Helical Piles by Dr. Howard Perko. That is literally the helical pile Bible in the industry. There is um, countless tests that have been done by helical piles. There's very, very simple theories and applications to very, very, very complicated equations. I highly recommend um, that you at least take a look at that book. It's about 500 pages or so. It's not a super entertaining read, but there is everything you will ever need to know about helical piles in that book. So the installation equipment. Um, we do a lot of uh, residential and smaller commercial. Our business is probably 80-20. I guess it would be small. Uh, smaller commercial residential would be 80. Larger commercial would be 20%. Now, I know I have a picture of a mini excavator here, but as the size of the pile scales up, everything stays the same, as in just larger. So it's still an excavator. It's still an installation uh, uh, hydraulic drive. It's just much, much larger as the pile sizes increase. So again, we have an operator who's installing this helical pile, and he is reading real time as he installs that helical pile. So there's no guesswork. We have guaranteed capacity. So out of sheer interest, um, how many uh, um, um, geotechs are there in the, in, in the room? Some of them are installers. Okay, so how often um, is it required, uh, or how big is the project, I guess? Is it required there's an actual uh, a, a geotech test done, there's a soils report that you have all the information um, about how big of a project generally would it need to be? It wouldn't be for, a, for obviously, for a, a home addition, or would it be? Or would it be just a larger commercial building? You might not, you might not see it necessarily for a for a home addition, but you definitely see it for homes. Okay. Now, so okay, so a building a building with a footprint of this size, how many test holes would you would you typically see? Six. Okay. Okay. Well, I well I, I you know I I wish I worked around here because generally it's one or two would be my the max in a building of this size. <laughs> so fair enough so one of the advantages so typically like i said typically in a building of a footprint of this size would be two holes probably one there one there on the other corner now that's all well and good for us because the more information we have but sometimes it's not certainly not enough for what we need. So how deep do you typically go? Do you have a minimum? Do you go, are you looking for something? How, how deep do you typically go? I think based around here you have, there's enough knowledge, you know, particularly in, in the city like this, there's enough knowledge between the, the two or three big firms in town that they know generally speaking, if they're on this block, it's, you know, Phil or, or Bedrock is gonna hit here. Okay. So we wanna penetrate through that. So they'll, they'll justify that depth based on that. Or if you know that the building is a, a very lightly loaded building, that will be shallower than they maybe to get to that material, just because they know it's it's the settlement vault will be pretty pretty shallow. Okay, fair enough. So I have seen more than a few reports that unfortunately they stop far too far too soon, as in they might go to twenty five or thirty feet, and all that tells us is the soil is still terrible at twenty five or thirty feet which is not really helpful. I mean, it's good information for us because uh, uh, like I'll talk about this shortly, it helps us calculate the lateral capacity of the pile on the, on the upper layer of the soil, but it really doesn't help us on how deep we'll need to go to get the capacity we want. Okay, like I said earlier, the operator is reading real time the resistance as he installs. So a helical pile is really a geotech report as we install live. So, we can use our helical pile. It's actually, we call it a test pile. So we can have our installer go out with a given size pile. In actuality, it doesn't matter the size pile as long as he tells us what it is. He installs that helical pile. 
comes to a job site with a footprint of this big, we have two test sites, it's good, but we all know how quickly the soil conditions can change, even in a building of this size, how quickly the soil conditions can change. So we can go, we can have our, send our, our operator out with his machine and his test pile, and he can install the same test pile over and over on a given site, recording the resistance he hits at every, at every foot. He can send that information back to us, and it is the same information. We can actually calculate the end values. We can get a soil report by using a test pile, and we can, again, use the same test pile over and over, and it gives us a very detailed map of the soil density throughout the job site. So when we spec our helical piles for the rest of the project, even though the loads might dictate, for instance, it requires a four and a half inch pile, but because the soil is very hard there, there's the, the bedrock is relatively shallow there, unreachable here, we can vary the size of the helix and the number of helices on that pile size to hit the capacity as soon as possible. Does that make sense? Or did I just complicate the conversation? Yes. Do you have any uh, papers correlating that, like with actual lab testing of densities? And oh, a hundred percent. Like, yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 in actuality, we can with that test pile report done from our installers. If we have a target, if we say, okay, um, our test pile went to fifty feet and he maxed his machine out. That's as deep as we, we got, fair enough. But we realize the soil is about a, a, an end value of say 20 at foot number, at, at 20 feet deep. We can calculate the, the, the helix size required that we will be able to hit our torque at about 20 feet so that we don't have to put extension after extension on to go deeper, 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 because that becomes very costly. It's much, much, much cheaper to get a larger helix or multiple helices on the lead section, as opposed to extension after extension after extension, but the result will be the same, right? Because we're always working under the assumption, and it's always true, eventually, the deeper we go, the better the soil is going to get, right? We all know that we're probably, there's a good chance we're going to hit this soft spot, we're going to hit this weaker soil in the in, as we install, but again, the advantage of helical piles are we're reading real time. We know that if we do hit this soft area on our gauge within our machine, we, we are not going to stop there. We're going to keep going because once the helix is embedded in good solid soil, that is going to give us our capacity. It doesn't matter what is around the tube or the shaft of the pile. It doesn't matter what happens. Expansive soil, high water table, doesn't matter as long as the helix is embedded in good solid soil. Yep. If you hit shallow bedrock and you just spin on it, is that kind of accepting? So how shallow? Okay, so that that's that. I'm not a sales guy, and you're you're getting ahead of me a little bit, but that's okay. So helical piles are good in literally every soil except shallow bedrock, because we have to have. There is a few rules of helical piles. One of them is the five times rule. We have to have five times the outside diameter of the of the of the helix in the soil, okay? So if you can imagine, and that's for lateral capacity. So don't forget, I'm gonna come back to your question, don't forget it. Okay, so I often hear a helical pile has none or very, very little lateral capacity, right? I hear that all the time. Okay, if I take our two and seven eighths pile, it's a quarter inch wall, it's 60 KSI steel, it's very, very strong. I take that helical pile and I install it in a parking lot where the soil is very compacted, very dense. I install it and I leave our standard six or eight inches above grade. It's immovable. I cannot move it. It is immovable. I take that exact same pile and I install it in some beach sand. I can almost push over with my foot. Did the pile change? No. It was the soil it's installed in. And that actually goes for the compression and tension values as well. 100% of the time, the limiting factor is always the soil. The soil will always give up before the pile will always. Okay, so when we're talking about a shallow bedrock, we need enough soil around our, our actual pile shaft, otherwise it will just fall over. So 
We have to have five times. If, if we have our pile on top of the bedrock, that's fine. As long as we have enough pile into the ground that we have lateral support. Because imagine an exaggerated example, we have bedrock at 18 inches below soil. Yes, we're gonna, I mean, we have all the capacity of the steel, but it's unrealistic. It's literally just gonna fall over. It's just balancing on there. So that's, so that's a hard no. I guess we're already that it's 20 feet deep. That's not a problem at all. But like, there's this big argument that because like the whole design is based on getting four numbers and we're just not doing that. Uh, yeah. And, and you're like, what does, what's the interface of the tip of the pile on the bedrock? So in a situation like that, when we're hundred percent sure we're gonna spin out on the bedrock, we would cut because our, our helical piles typically have a 45 degree. We would cut our pile flat. So we'd have 100% of the contact on the tube. So do you use tube diameter as your very, your very area, or do you use the first two four plus two to say your very area? So, okay. So realistically, now if we're calculating tension, because it, whether we want to or not, there's always tension in, in when we install as well. There's always tension requirements as well. So we're going to look at the last torque number we got before we spun out on the bedrock. And that will be our tension value. Now, as far as, as compression, typically we want torque values, but because what happens is when we anchor on the bedrock like that, we have to be sure the consistency and what the bedrock is, right? Is it just, is it just did we get unlucky? Is it, is it some kind of a caliche or something like that? Or is it really good bedrock? Hence, uh, a geotech report that's the information we need exactly. And then, you know, then we can, we can anchor it on the, on the bedrock with confidence. Right. Um, again, it's just our installation equipment, uh, our monitoring. So some of our installers used a PSI gauge that just measure the, the, the torque output of the drive. Some like Lisa's crews, they all have a, a digital readout on the machine as well. So it's reading real time that the actual, um, the real time as we install and it makes a printout, you can email it to your customers. Um, we always have installation reports, every bit of information. Actually, that leads me to another question. After you guys do spec a helical pile into a given job, do you require anything from the installer, anything from the job after it's done or after you just, or is it just up to the, the engineer if, he's, if there's one involved, is it gone? Or, or what do you require after the job? So for instance, you're doing your job because the because the, the, the soil is terrible. You have, let me back up a little more. We have to spec in the market without standard reports requirements, installation log requirements, certification. Do you guys want to see it? Or do you have, okay, so, that, so this is my other, my other part of my question. So for instance, um, there is a building, B, say we're, we're putting up this building. Um, how, walk me through the process. Do the engineers contact you with the plans? Has there already been a geotech report done for the, for the site? Do you recommend the foundation they're gonna use? Do you just say this is the soil conditions and then they decide the, the, the foundation they're gonna use? Kind of walk me through that. Generally speaking around here, you know, the geotech that's done first. Okay. Then the geotech's gonna work with their structural engineering or design build team to specify how they're going to build said building. Okay. And then suppliers will be brought in after the fact. Sometimes suppliers are brought in as part of the design team, sometimes not. Okay. So you'll have a building, you'll get a set of building plans they're asking you to bid that says we already have helical files planned for this building. We need this capacity at these locations. Okay. Go. Very often in this market, the helical file spec is a performance spec. Correct. Helical file installers are dealing with the location and the load. And that's spec. Here's the, here's the service load on this call location, but it appears in the Okay. Yeah, it's typically it's typically commercial. You're gonna you're talking about commercial. Most of the time, in terms of what people are gonna want, as as part of your installation warranty documentation, they're gonna want to see your torque output. Okay. And I'm on the design side. I'd say we did borings to 25 feet. We recommend yield piles. Preliminary estimates for capacities of say 15 kits. They should you know the Helix size, spacing could be determined when column loads are known, wall loads are known, and the specific helix designs to be provided by the manufacturer. Okay. Usually we run it in like Helix Pro, and this is our assumed loads, and 
this is what we're anticipating is going to be used, but it's ultimately on the cubicle designer to provide that based on the end of the construction engineer. And this usually dictates all the heap and people are still looking for it. Yeah, and then we'll typically have a field engineer out there doing observations during the okay. session. Well, okay. That's your special, special. Yeah. Okay. okay. I, I was just very curious because every part of the country is very, very different. Like I was saying, in in St. Louis, for instance, it was the 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 engineer uh, involved in uh, in charge of the the project of the building would take the information provided by the geotech report, but ultimately they would make the decision, and that's kind of where I, and then. In when I was in Utah, for instance, it was much the opposite. It was the geotech who uh, didn't insist, but made a very, very firm recommendation. You are going to use this as a foundation, and then the the engineer. So I was just very curious of 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 how it was done here. More questions like that will be uh, in Lisa's department than myself. Here in Minnesota, we over engineer everything. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> can i add can i add sure by all means uh, so so basically most of the stuff that we're talking about here is mostly commercial work okay um what we do uh for the most part is residential so now most of you I, if you're familiar with piles <clears throat> you would be familiar with ac 358 which is the acceptance criteria for healing piles across the board, right? Um, I sat in on the tail end of, of the, the end of, um, we, we changed some things, the board uh, that dealt with this document changed some things and, and we added the uh, Appendix A, which is at the end of the three uh, AC 350, I think it's 356, right? And, and uh, which is strictly for residential use. So what that does is it eliminates the soil report for residential. Okay, it doesn't it doesn't eliminate a structural engineer, um, but it does eliminate the requirement for 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 um, a soil report because realistically, like James was saying, we're doing a soil report as we're installing the pile, and we're talking about a whole lot less loads than we are obviously in a commercial project. So. That's something if you guys are interested in taking a look at it, it's it's actually it's an interesting read for me because I I helped put some of that together and give my input as a code official and being out looking at these things and also um, also um, trying to um, quote uh, projects with residential and try not to overdo some of the I mean. Some of the, some of these residential projects can get extremely uh, 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 expensive if you if you start adding a soil report and all that kind of stuff. So so there was some changes done to that document, which are which is very interesting, and obviously I've passed on to a lot of our building departments and whatnot, so that they have a document to refer back to. But so perfect. <laughs> okay, uh, again, uh, we as installers. We'll supply you with anything you need. If it's the installation report, uh, conformity report, uh, it's been my experience in uh, in most places is that the closer we are to a larger city, the more paperwork, if you will, is required. In Toronto, for instance, you cannot build a two by two step without having our, our architectural drawing, a conformity report, uh, a stamp, et cetera, et cetera. However, once you get a little farther away from a city, it becomes a little more um uh i don't want to say lax but i guess it is kind of it's more lax so um but all that to say whatever you require as an official um we can we can uh, uh, supply it so this is our stamp technical sheet we have one for every state and every province now this these are just the maximum capacities of our given helical piles uh it's the outside diameter with the wall thickness now, this is our load chart. I know it's very, very busy. There's a lot going on there. So I suggest, I, I would like you to go to the App Store. It's free. And we have an app there. It's called the Goliath Text Compile System. It's actually this on your phone. So it's a drop-down menu. You choose your pile size. 
you hit your, your applied torque because every, the way we measure the capacity of a helical pile is the application of torque. That's what the, the direct correlation between the, the, the applied torque to the helix and the capacity of our pile. So I suggest, I, I would like to go to the app store. It's this, and it is literally uh, our applied torque on our, on our helical pile, the outside diameter. We, we have a KT factor. Does anyone out of sheer interest know what a KT factor, what the KT factor is? Excellent. Can you explain it briefly or? No, no, there's more to it. What's that? No, there's more with the KT factor though, there's more to it. What is the KT factor? That's my question. Well, that's why you find the superior data from the 1980s. It's also AC358, EFI, guide. What is it? <laughs> Okay, super, uh, I'll give you the, the real condensed version is because you may have, you may have been wondering, okay, if 100% of our capacity is the helix itself, is measured as we torque the helix itself, what, and I said we, we, we ignore the skin friction. You may be wondering, well, what happens is the tube size increases that's causing more resistance, but if it's only going to the helix, isn't that giving us false numbers? And you would not be wrong. And that's where the KT factor comes in. So the KT factor is directly related to the size of the outside diameter of the tube. So again, we are ignoring that skin friction, but it is there. It helps us laterally, but we ignore it for our compression and tension numbers. The larger the tube, the smaller the KT factor. Fair enough? Okay, so like I said earlier, uh, we not only do we 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 built our business on tests done by others, but we also destructive test all of our own uh, products as well, from piles to bolts. Now, out of sheer interest, how often, if ever, do you require an on-site load test where you would want the piles, you know, prop not obviously not in the hole that will be supporting the building, but you want the piles physically tested on site. Anything under 10,000 square feet. You would require an on site load test? Okay. And you follow the ASTM, the ASTM rules to the letter? Okay. Fair enough. Okay. So this test is literally, so we, this is our personal test we did for our, for our information. And this is following the ASTM rules to the letter for the deep, for testing and deep foundations. So if, for instance, we, now, that being said, we do try to avoid these tests because they're, they're, they're time consuming and they are difficult. Sometimes I can, I can talk an engineer into adding another safety factor on the pile install to avoid this because, again, it, it's time consuming and it's quite difficult. However, um, if it's a government project or something like that, then they require and that's just the way it is. So the way this works is the installer would go out, install these four anchor piles the center pile to be tested. And then we would have another third party engineer and his technician come on site with his calibrated equipment and actually do the physical test to, to measure the, the allowable movement of the helical pile. Do you guys have by any chance in, an engineer with a technician that you may have used in the past? Okay. Not necessarily all on helicals, but on different sizes of paper models. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, like I said, I, I mean, we, we in, in seriousness, we do try to avoid them because they're very difficult and expensive. But again, sometimes they're unavoidable. And, and so that's a good question. That's why I asked if you follow the rules of the ASTM, because the rules according to the ASTM, no, you cannot. However, the, so the, the ASTM document, is, is lengthy and it's very detailed, et cetera, et cetera, until you get to the last paragraph and it circumvents the whole thing. The last paragraph says, unless the project engineer decides another way is acceptable, hence Jack against the excavator. And that's perfect. If he signs off on it, it's 100% perfect. But the weight of the excavator has to be 20% heavier than the maximum you're going to be testing for. That's the only stipulation. But yes, and, and again, like... A tension test is, is actually very, very easy because we can use the arm of the excavator to pull up because we're not measuring the movement. So you would have your bucket on the ground, your excavator here, 
and your pile here and you just pull it straight up. It's a very, that's a really easy test because it doesn't matter if, what's that? That's what we're saying. But that's why I was asked. That's why I was asking you if you follow the AS team rules to the letter, because technically you're not allowed unless you go back to that, that end paragraph where it says, if the, the project engineer accepts, then it's acceptable. But yeah, that's by far the easiest way because this is, 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 is difficult and complicated. But again, sometimes we have to follow the rules and they, and they stick to the ASTM. So this, I'm sure you've all seen this. This is just a computer simulation. Again, we test everything um, from a very, very simple flat plate design like this to a much, much more complicated design with actual moving parts. Obviously, red is bad, blue is good. Fair enough. Okay. Um, how are we on time? Uh, so I'm not going to bore you with all the advantages of the helical piles because we, we are all uh, uh, pretty much aware of helical piles, but I will tell you um, kind of a, a funny story is we have, um, so we have been working very, very hard with Clayton Homes. They're the largest manufacturer of manufactured homes in North America, mobile homes. So uh, we have been working very hard with them for the last five years or so, and we are an accepted foundation uh, for their manufactured homes in their installation manual. So we have a very um, uh, uh, well-detailed design with our helical piles that require no extra tie downs, no concrete, etc. So we actually tied onto their on their uh, I beam frame. The, the piles not only hold up the home but also hold it down. So we have a few of our, our franchisees, a few of our installers who do do manufactured homes. And one of our, our installers in Indianapolis, he sent one of his crews out to do a double wide. And he went out in the early afternoon to see how things were going. So he showed up on site and they had installed 34 piles on the wrong lot. He's like, <laughs> son of a. All they did was unscrew them, went two lots down, put them all back in the ground, and they were still able to set the house before the end of the day. If it was tradi any traditional foundation, the way they generally do it, it would have been a catastrophe, especially in Indianapolis, because the, there's a real shortage of concrete, especially a few months ago, huge waiting time, huge minimums. It would have been a real catastrophe. So helical piles are removable and 100% reusable. Now there's a few, I'm not, again, I'm not gonna bore you with all the applications, but there are, a, there are a few that I really wanna point out to you. One of them is encasing the helical pile head in concrete, okay? So this is a very, very common practice. So we, in this design, we have all the ease of buildability with the concrete, but we have all the guaranteed capacity with the helical pile. Okay, so if we go a few slides ahead, So if people are, have a little bit of awareness of helical piles, this is usually what they are aware of, underpinning foundation repair, rip, repairing a foundation or a building that is failing, right? Okay, now this particular job, this was a, a, a very involved job and it was in a very expensive job, but they had no other choice. The house was too valuable to just tear down windows and and they have a it's a little hard to see but they have a nice big crack here water was coming in they really had no choice but to underpin their house so this job don't quote me on the price but i believe this job was around seventy five thousand dollars to repair the foundation of this home but they had no other choice okay now it it never stopped raining it's a little hard to see but this there's water everywhere their their driveway fell in the hole there was a risk of their pools moving it was it was it was a huge job, but they had no other option. Okay. So it was $75,000 for the foundation repair plus, plus, plus. Okay. So what is the real answer? The real answer is to be ahead of the problem during the building process. If there's any risk at all, and let's face it, there always is, is to have the helical piles encased in the concrete. That house we were just looking at, if they would have in the formwork, if they would have installed those helical piles in the formwork, tied it in with the rest of the steel, and then encased it all with concrete, it would have been fifteen to twenty thousand dollars max, and it would have been no risk of the foundation settling and cracking down the road. 
I know sometimes, not sometimes, all the time, it's a little bit of a hard conversation with, with builders, contractors, because they don't want to spend that extra money now. They want to build and get out. But the real answer is there. If there is a risk of settling foundations, have the helical piles in the foundation, in the formwork, during the build, it's exponentially easier and cheaper. Any questions about the in the in the concrete? So we we have we have um, out of sheer interest. I checked recently. So we have designed just under three thousand different pile heads in the past for different applications. Everything from a very simple flat plate that we've seen to electric car charging station mounts to uh, heads with moving parts to um, I believe we have about 250 different style rebar heads to tie two pores together, three pores together um, instead container of homes. container homes, container homes, I, it's becoming big, right? Container homes, right? And 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 the rebar heads as well. We have an adjustable rebar head, so we it replaces the cradle, so it actually holds up the rest of the steel. So again, the the real answer is to be ahead of the problem. Bit of, uh... And it's designed for uplift and Yeah, 100%. So we actually, so we, so as a matter of fact, we have a 20 year patent on an adjustable fixed head. So our head is physically attached to the pile. So all our competitors, they have the adjustable head. If we go back a few slides with the, um, so this, this is actually, actually, let's go a little farther. We'll see it better. So right here, so we have a patent on this. So our adjustable head is physically mechanically locked to our pile. So we have a patent on that. All of our competitors on their adjustable head has only the weight of the structure that's actually holding that pile head into their pile. I have countless pictures in wind zones, flood zones, et cetera, of our competitors' heads literally pulling out of the pile and coming down beside it and the building failing. So yep. two slides, the, the adjustable head. Yep. What you're saying is the, the very top right, there's threads. Yep. That That's a threaded rod. There. Yep. So when you hit your torque, hopefully the where the pin connection is within what, like a couple inches of where you want that mm -hmm. top plate to be. Okay, so 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 okay. So that's a good very good question. Now we always have the option of cutting the pile and redrilling it to height. You take a torch and cut it. No, no, we, we have a cutting jig. So we have a fixed cutting jig. So then we have a bandsaw. So we have to we have the we have the jig to make sure that we cut the head perfectly flat. If not, this head will not sit flat on the pile and the button the bolts will not line up anymore. So we cut and drill the pile on site if we need to, if we have to get a proper height. And then what's the largest diameter you use? 12 and three quarter. You still use a big saw. Well, okay, funny enough, that's a bit of a different design with different applications. So our six and five eighths and larger do not have this connection like that. They actually have a donut bolt flange, one on top of the other. Because of the reason we went that route is because of the installation torque they can potentially take is too much. It would actually rip the through bolt. So that's why we have the donut flange. So those are a little more complicated with when the design for the attachment point. Is that like the threaded adjustment is yep. super handy? Okay. It, 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 so every, because, oh, so, so every adjustable head we have, we have a fixed head option as well. Every, and, and Lisa will attest to this, every contractor that wants to use a fixed head because they are marginally cheaper, the second they try the adjustable head, they uh, say, forget the fixed head. It's so easy. If you, I mean, I'm not sure how much uh, construction you guys have done, but if you make four or five cuts on a job site, one on the high side of the line, one on the low side, one on the high side, one on the low side, suddenly you get there and you're a quarter inch off. You're like, son of a, what are you going to do? Shim underneath your four by four. It looks terrible. With that, you literally give it a spin. That's a one inch rod, a one inch threaded rod, a number eight threads. So, and it has four holes on the head. So we have infinite adjustability so that we can line up to, to make sure to, to height without well, having to. Well, not only that, but... <clears throat> When the lumber today shrinks after a couple of years, you can pull the bolts and take a monkey wrench and and uh, move move that uh, base cap Spin. and re-level everything fully loaded. 
that's right. Yeah. Well, I guess torque so because I've seen that like ready to cap. But you have a patent on it? So we have a patent on the fixed. Because what happens is, and I'm not here to bash the competition, but all our competitors have uh, an adjustable option. But again, it's the weight of the structure. It's just sitting on top of the pile. How it never got patented before we did, I'm not really sure. It seems so obvious now, but again, they're SOL. Okay. The photos are really fun to pass around with the building department. Make sure you guys know what what manufacturer you're looking at. So, so this is what Lisa was talking about. So again, we have we have countless connection point, different heads. So this locks up into the pod of the container, just like it does on the container chassis. So it goes up into the pod and locks in place. And we have a double one. So you have one pile and it actually holds two containers side by side when you want to get them very, very close. For instance, you want like a four or five wide, whatever. Uh, another very good application, helical piles are retaining walls. Again, the, the ideal application is to do it before the building process. But again, uh, we do a lot of repairs of failing retaining walls as well. Simply cut a hole inside, drill our, install, our helical pile. It's a little hard to see, but we have a larger plate, larger than the hole we made. How are we on time? Okay, so any questions so far about any of the pictures you've seen? Any questions about anything we've talked about? Question. So you, uh, <clears throat> you showed some fixed tilt solar where you end up with two rows of piles yep. and create determinancy, everything results back to an axial load. Do you have a solution for a tracker system where it's a single row of piles and has to take that flexure from the lateral load on the solar? So that is a very good question, young man. Very good question. Now, this is, for instance, uh, this is for a single mount, um, all earth uh, uh, solar panel. So this is a perfect example of when we're talking about the limitations of helical piles for lateral loads, because that single mount solar panel, it was, I don't remember, it was maybe 8,000 pounds, 10,000 pounds. As far as a helical pile, it's very light in compression load. I mean, we could easily take that on our on our, our second smallest pile. However, because of the of, of the of the of the loads, the wind loads, et cetera, et cetera, we have to have an enormous pile on the ground, in the ground rather, to take those loads. So even though a small one, a small helical pile could take the compression loads, it doesn't matter. We have to, we have to calculate for our lateral loads and use a much, much larger pile. And I have a question. <laughs> Sorry. So isn't the panel going to, if we have that much lateral load on a panel, isn't the panel going to pretty much disintegrate before it would ever pull out, out the pile? Well, no. If, if you are on a tracked uh, solar system, you've got two to three tips of axial load. You've got you know, one and a half to two and a half hits of lateral load. Sure. And it's maintaining your deflection limit. You only have a range deflection limit at the top of the pile. Okay. So all the, the panel itself won't crack. It's usually the connection between top of the pile and the torque. I apologize. I just, nope. that's always been. No, that, that's fine. <laughs> now that, that, that leads me to another point that I wanted to meet. Now, it's almost always better regardless of the project, regardless of what's going on top, it's almost always better to use more smaller piles than fewer large ones, right? Because as opposed to, imagine our little scenario. So we're talking about a single mount solar. That's a big pile. It's 10 and three quarter inch pile. That's a big pile. It's an expensive pile to put in the ground. Now we can actually get more lateral capacity if we would have used four smaller piles connected together. Because as we load it this way, this pile is now at a compression, but this one's under tension. And that's the strong suit of a helical pile, is the, is the straight compression tension. Not so much the lateral, because again, 100% of the time, what's going to fail is the soil guaranteed. 
We have done countless tests, like we saw that big test rack we did before. We tested that one to 100 tons. As predicted, um, when the technician is, is, is loading it with his, with, his, with his jack, it's a little hard to see, but the hose is only about this long. And he's jacking this thing. And everyone's standing back, but he only has about three, three feet of hose. So anyway, when it finally failed, I don't remember what the number was, our target. I, th I believe it was four millimeters. So once that pile went down more than four millimeters, it was considered a failure. And, but of course, that was, the, that was the, the goal, the absolute destructive testing. As predicted, we removed that helical pile and it was 100% fine, ready to do, ready to go on the next project. Uh, as predicted, the soil is what failed. The soil is, is always the, the limiting factor. <clears throat> Okay, so one thing I did want to say. Uh, all our certificates and everything's on our, on our website. I, I, I invite you to take a look at our website. It's very informative. Any questions, um, by all means, contact Lisa. She would be the one to, to, to answer it. Um, this is a Canadian thing. There's Lisa right there. So... There, the real reason we went with the franchise franchisee based system is not that we want to control our franchisees business. That's not, that was never the goal. As simple as a helical pile appears, there is an unbelievable amount of engineering that goes into the design, the manufacturing, the specking the helical pile into a given project. We did not want to leave the most important part to just chance so that's why we went with the, the, the franchisee-based system so that we could make sure the most important part of the, uh, the whole process, which is the installation, we could quote unquote control. Because after our engineers design a, a foundation using helical piles in Magog, Quebec, we load them on a truck, we send them to Texas. We wanna be 100% confident that once it gets to, to Texas, it is installed as designed. So our engineers can stamp off on it. You can stamp off on it. We can be 100% confident in it. We do not sell our helical piles to just anyone. We sell only to our certified installers, our franchisees. I actually, I don't even call them franchisees. I call them our installers. So we only sell to our installers. We do not sell to just anyone because in theory, anyone with a farm tractor and a three-point hitch and, a, and an auger drive could in theory get one of these in the ground. Would you want to sign off on any of your projects on that? Of course not. So that's that's the whole reason we went the franchisee-based system. So that's pretty much it. Uh, again, uh, you, you guys uh, really had that. I, I, I went pretty fast over the basics of the helical piles because you guys already have the basics. So any questions? So all, all of our helical piles, so all of our helical piles are hot dip galvanized. All our bolts, our heads, everything is hot dip galvanized. Now, that being said, everything we have galvanized, we have an option of black steel as well. So if you have a, if you have, um, a soil test for corrosion, uh, it's signed off on that, that there is no cor corrosion protection and cost is definitely a, a driver for the project. We, we have a black pile, op, an unprotected option. However, most, I, I don't think you guys use any of the black piles. No. So we yeah, have. It meets and exceeds the ASTM yeah. requirements. Yeah. So everything is black. Is black. Is a uh, hundred gallon. Uh, 100 corrosion to single dip or. Yeah. One dip. Yeah. So now that being said, if for instance, there was a building going up that had a very, very long service life and the soil was very corrosive, we could uh, deal with it case by case. For instance, we would have a different galvanization process. We could potentially have a cathodic system. We would have um, like a polyurea dip. There's always an option when the, when the soil is very, very corrosive. And, and that probably happens in different parts of the U.S., right? I mean, more corrosive soils. You know, not in yes, but but it. I mean, the, the galvanization always meets always meets code. So. I mean, I have been asked occasionally about st stainless steel. We could do stainless steel. Of course, the, the, what's the, it's very expensive. That's, that's the rub. But I mean, stainless steel is always an option, but it's very, very expensive. Or like testing from experience. Yep. Typically, use the, the larger diameter piles. I've only seen like a nice, big, pretty much diameter. A hundred percent of the time, 
the large piles are only used when there's a lot of lateral concerns. Because even a relatively small pile, for instance, our two and seven eighths pile, it's it's small. I mean, it's two and seven eighths pile. It has 34,000 pounds of working load compression value. It's a lot. If you have a group of those, I mean, you have 100,000 pounds in a small group. It's 100% it's, it's of the time, large piles, always when there's a lateral concern. Now, that being said, there are other ways to address lateral concerns with helical piles. We can have a battered pile, as in a vertical load-bearing pile, and then an, an angled pile. Um, or we could have cross bracing as an option as well. What size are the max helix size when you make that? All depends on the tube size. There's a math on, on what it can go. For instance, our two and seven eighths pile, the largest one we can put on it is a 21 inch helix, but we can put multiple 21s on it. Because what happens is if we go too large, the what 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 is the limiting factor is the strength of the weld. Then it turns into potentially, potentially a bowl. What do you do for a 12 inch quarter for helix? I mean, 48, 54? It all depends on the 100% of the time when a pile of that size is, is done. There's always a bunch of uh, pile tests as well. So it will always be specific to that job. But yeah. It, and surprisingly, though, when it's a 12 and 3 quarter inch pile, the helix is not very big because, again, it's a lateral concern. It's that we're not looking for huge torque numbers because the loads are not very high. It's again, it'll be like a lamp post or something like that will require, or like the uh, single mount solar. Yeah. So on those, like, let's say, probably a 30 foot, uh, what would a section, like 10 foot section? So, a uh, good question. So, well, there's the two parts. So, that connection, especially like on the, the large diameter yep. ones, is it just a couple of bolts? I mean, in my experience, the, the, the problem I'm running into, right, is if you're specking uh, 15 tips of lateral load, but I can just kick it an inch with my foot because there's these bolted connections mm. every 10 feet. Like, do you like pre- on, 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 on the large piles like that and on the six and three quarter, like the six and three quarter has six one inch bolts. It's it, it's immovable. Yeah. It is immovable. And it's right? Yeah, it's immovable. It's, it's not. It's not going anywhere. Well, it's got a couple. Of, they, it goes like together, like the rest of them, right? No, nope. no, nope. it's it's flat. It's, we don't, it, we don't no. install those large piles. Yeah, so. it's it's a donut. It's a it's it's a flange bolt to another flange. Yeah. With and the small ones has six, uh, one inch bolts. Like it's it, it's it's literally not going anywhere. So I guess specifically to residential, I wondered this. My neighbors had some helical garage that had an issue. Mm -hmm. You guys are coming, and I know you have like, basically tested as you install it. I, I get that. You guys are ahead of when you require or request borings before you come in and do a certain so if if it's so a hundred percent of the time when there's a job that requires it, that's how we're already done before we show up. It's always done. It's never happened the other way around. It's already done. But I have it has happened a few a few installers have gone out and done test piles for different for different builders, knowing they're not going to get the job. It was never to be it was never going to be on piles, but they wanted the information of the pile test. But we've done a lot of test piles for customers. Yep. You know, and went out and did a test pile because. You know, for instance, the soil soil report, you're talking about at least 1500 bucks, right? At least we'll go out and do a test pile for roughly that, but we can actually install a pile wherever. I mean, usually, I mean, if we will take that amount off of the, the total job, but we're going to put it probably in where it needs to be. Um, but we have gone out and done test piles. Um, we've done a lot of work for uh, Three Rivers where we've had to go out and do test piles because we're dealing with, you know, um, areas where we don't want to put, um, they don't want to bring in pumper trucks and, you know, co concrete trucks and, and that kind of thing. And they want to, they want to put in a new boardwalk and that kind of stuff. And, but they're not quite sure about what we're dealing with. So we would go out and do a test pile and, and then, you know, pull that out. And then we at least have an idea of how deep we're going to go. Part, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So to finish answering your, your question, our standard length piles and extensions are seven feet. Our semi-standards are three and a half and 10, but we are the manufacturer. So we can make them as long as they as we want, as long, but what always comes up is the limiting factor is the reach of the machine. 
I mean, we can, we can make a, a, a 10 and three quarter inch 20 feet long, but we need a me machine to make the reach and they're expensive to ship and they're hard to handle too. So we have to make everything into, kind of take everything into consideration when we do it. Any other questions, concerns? All right, cool. Well, if there's no other questions,